Hey, what's up? It's Jim, and today I'm going to talk about the film Furious 7. Furious 7 had a lot going against it from the onset. You don't have the director of the last four Fast and Furious films, Justin Lin. Paul Walker died during production. The Rock's not in it as much as usual. This could really be kind of the end of the upswing that this franchise has really had, starting with the fifth entry. But Furious 7 has all the dumb escapism fun that you really expect from the Fast and Furious films. It has all all the action, all the excitement, all the kinetic energy, and all of the escapism and all the lug-headedness that you really want from these movies. It absolutely delivers the post-Fast Five kind of Fast and Furious film that audiences and myself really love. James Wan, he's not really known for action movies, he's more known for horror. He's really kind of hiding in the shadow of Justin Lin. You can really tell this is a post-Justin Lin Fast and Furious film. None of the action sequences feel like a different kind of take on the Fast and Furious films. It feels like he's just kind of trying to keep up with Justin Lin's style and do that same kind of kinetic crazy action sequences that we saw from the previous Fast and Furious films and kind of trying to up them once again. I don't think James Wan did a bad job directing this film. They still delivered a really good entry within the franchise, but it did feel like James Wan wasn't really trying to do anything different. He wasn't trying to rock the boat. He wasn't trying to do a different take on it. Now, do I want that from a Fast and Furious film? Not not really. I don't think anyone really wanted that at all. So it's not a real complaint, but it is interesting. Someone like James Wan, who I consider more of an auteur when you look at Insidious or The Conjuring, his previous two films, or even Saw. But then when I see Furious 7, it feels like he's more of the Justin Lin replacement and he's trying to direct like Justin Lin. It's standing in the shadow of this franchise's reputation and really living up to that for the most part. Deckard Shaw, who is the big bad evil older brother of the last villain of the last Fast and Furious film and he has decided to take his revenge on the Fast and Furious crew for messing up his younger brother although his younger brother's not dead and he first goes after Luke Cobbs played by Dwayne The Rock Johnson and messes The Rock up he sends a bomb to the infamous house of the Toretto clan and blows it up but fortunately Paul Walker, Vin Diesel, and Jordana Brewster get out of there but they need to go on the run because they know this guy is after them and they team up with the government and a government agent called Mr. Nobody played by Kurt Russell, who gets them on his side to locate this hacker, who first you think it's going to be this nerdy guy, but oh no, it's a girl and she's pretty. They go and get her and it's a crazy sequence. So she invented this computer program called God's Eye and you can use any computer camera or cell phone camera and track someone and find someone and if they have it, they can find Jason Statham's character and get him, even though he kind of just shows up anytime they do anything. So why they actually need this makes no sense, but again, fast Fast and Furious movie, so it's like sense and logic and reason don't work with these. So they do that and they kind of bring her in, this hacker girl who was in Game of Thrones, into their crew, try to defeat Jason Statham before he can get them and before this evil terrorist played by Diamond Hunshu comes after them and destroys them as well and they're on the run and with government money and cool government money cars to hopefully beat the bad guys. Every Fast and Furious film since Fast Five has had this thing like, one last ride, this is the last ride. And it's like every movie they say that. So, but this film felt like the lastest of the last rides. It kind of brings a conclusion to the thing Justin Lin left. And Chris Morgan, who wrote all of the Justin Lin films and actually wrote this one, I actually kind of think maybe that's why this film feels very similar to the Justin Lin films. Maybe Chris Morgan is more of an architect than we were really appreciating when Justin Lin was directing. I'm not sure. I guess I'll see what the next one. The whole idea with Han and how 4, 5, and 6 all took place before Tokyo Drift, that whole plot line ended with this. I like the kind of continuity of these films. The Fast and Furious franchise oddly has become semi like the Marvel films. When I saw Fast 5, I didn't know where Han was from. I didn't know where Guy Godot was from. I didn't know where those two other guys were from. I just knew it was a fun, stupid, ridiculously excessive action movie, and I had a great time. And the cool thing about the Fast and Furious films is they can do that and you don't really need to have seen the other Fast and Furious films but if you have there's a lot of cool little things in there for you. This film probably has a lot more than usual. They do wrap up the Tokyo Drift thing in kind of a hilarious way because they actually have a scene from Tokyo Drift in this movie. The end scene where Bow Wow comes up to Lucas Black and says you know oh this is Han's friend and you should race him and they have that scene. Then 
then they have him and Vin Diesel talking, which was obviously not shot during the shoot of Tokyo Drift. Now, if you know anything about Tokyo Drift, Lucas Black didn't really look like a high schooler then. He looked way too old to be a high school student. Add like nine years onto that. Also, the fact that you're seeing the exact scene he was in nine years ago, right before it, and they have a shot of him now. It's just so jarring. Like they kind of try to make him look the same, but you're like, whoa, dude. The action is still up to par. And I think, you know, having a car drive out of a skyscraper in Abu Dhabi through another skyscraper and then through a third skyscraper is just kind of the ridiculous one-upsmanship, excessive kind of almost Calvin and Hobbes-ish logic to the way they make these action sequences. They always have these action sequences that keep going and going and going and have this cohesive nature to them and have cars coming in for no reason sometimes. Things keep happening and keep happening. It's just an amazing roller coaster ride of an action sequence. And there's a real amazingness to that. That's kind of one of the things about James Wan directing this, other than Justin Lin, is like he's definitely keeping up up with that pace that's an incredible pace to keep up with i mean it's like a herculean effort to keep up with that kind of thing and he certainly did it i actually think he successfully modeled after justin lynn he's just doing it a little too much even the the car chases at night i actually thought were some of the best night car chases done in a recent fast and furious film most of the time when they do car chases at night the cinematography is actually kind of poor and they've slowly gotten better at it although the plane thing was pretty amazing but that was amazing because of a lot of other things but and there's a lot of physical big fight sequences there's probably more like physical fight sequences in this film than there's been in any of the previous Fast and the Furious films it feels like they were more into that this time I like the Michelle Rodriguez Ronda Rossi fight the Jason Statham the Rock fight and then the Jason Statham Vin Diesel fight and Paul Walker fighting Tony Jaa James Wan really got into those and was just as apt at doing the car chases as he was at doing these like amazing physical fight sequences. He doesn't do the shaky cam thing too much. It was a little shaky and a lot of quick cutting and things. I kind of wish they cut that down. In The Rock, Jason Statham fight, if you ever see movies where they have an office that has like a lot of glass, they don't have walls. It's just like tons and tons of glass. You always think like, I mean, that looks nice, but that's such a dumb movie thing. And then they just start throwing each other through these glass walls. Oh my God, someone's finally found a good reason for this set piece. It's so those Jason Statham and The Rock can throw each other through glass. This is amazing. Like, why did no one think of this before? It's a real eye-opening moment. I will never look at an investigative police set the same way again without thinking of The Rock or Jason Statham smashing themselves through them. One of the bigger complaints I have with Furious 7 is the thing I really liked about Fast 5 and Fast and Furious 6 is that you had The Rock. The problem with Fast and Furious films, the action is never the problem, but Paul Walker and Vin Diesel, they're not very good actors. When they brought The Rock in, The Rock has a lot of charisma. He really certainly gets the kind of movie he's in. It's kind of interesting when you look at the original cast members seem to take it seriously probably because they don't like have other movies they can be in because like no one wants to see those. The Rock doesn't have that as much although these are much bigger than anything else he's in. I missed him in this film. He kind of bookends the film. He's in the beginning and the end. I know at the time he was shooting Hercules or something. I'm not exactly sure but he was shooting something else and I wish he was more in it. I wish they had an actor with charisma in more of the film. Kurt Russell always kind of gets the kind of performance and the kind of movie he's in almost more than any of the other actors in the movie. This goes back to Kurt Russell throughout his whole career. He just always really gets it and he looked like he was having fun. Like he got the fun of these kind of movies and you can see that through his performance. Supposedly when they signed him to do this they signed him so he'll just have a small appearance in this and then a bigger appearance in the next one if there is a next one which there probably will be because these things will never end. The Paul Walker stuff I really didn't notice anything that was like his brothers were body doubles for him so they can complete shooting and these special effects except for the parts at the end that were obviously like a tribute to him and stuff and were pretty clear that they were doing that I didn't really notice anything there were a couple times I was like maybe that's someone else sort of I'm not exactly sure but for the most part I didn't really see it they do try to do kind of a tribute at the end I understand why they did it but it was super cheesy no spoilers or anything but there is nothing after the credits they usually set up the next one. It seems odd that they signed Kurt Russell for that thing and they've signed other actors for 
future Fast and Furious film, but there really is nothing that's setting up an eighth film, which is odd because the fifth and the sixth very much did that. So I don't know what's exactly happening with that. It was kind of unfortunate. I did wait throughout the whole credits. I really wanted to see what was coming up next. There's kind of people who get the Fast and Furious films, the people who actually like the Fast and Furious films, and people who just don't understand them and don't understand why someone like me would like them or like why critics seem to like it and there's kind of a cinephile thing for these films now. It started with Fast Five. I think Fast Five was really the turning point for this franchise when they just had a tons of stupid money and they could just do whatever they wanted and then it just became a lot of fun. No one does escapism as well as the Fast and Furious films. Just pure unadulterated action movie ridiculous escapism. Most of summer movie season is kind of about that. Especially now when everybody's trying to do this serious dark thing or they're trying to really say something about something. Look, the Fast and Furious films, they don't really get what those things are. And they shouldn't never get what those things are. They are dumb escapism and that's what's so beautiful about them. How many times have they had cars flying or, you know, the amazing sequence in Rio at the end of Fast Five with the vault that they chained to two cars and which smashing into buildings and shit, you know, the amazing plane sequence in Fast and Furious 6, seeing a car drive through a bunch of buildings in this entry, they give you that joke of an action movie that people make fun of action movies for. But it just does it in such an unadulterated way you kind of love them for it. They have such a spirit to them that you kind of can't deny them. I mean they have like every action star currently under the sun in each of them. They have tons and tons of money to make these ridiculous action sequences. Everyone wants a fun dumb movie so they don't have to think about their jobs or their life or whatever's going on in the world. And these are really kind of turn your brain off kind of movies. But the Fast and Furious films are the finest example of that. They're wonderful at it because that is all they want to do. I love that energy to them. They will never change and be too serious. They will always be fun and jokey. I'm never gonna stop really liking them if they stay at this quality because they kind of thrilled and amazed everyone with Fast Five and won everyone over from a franchise that I just did not care about and was never going to care about and was dumbstruck by how it stuck around for so long. They just didn't care. Let's make the most ridiculous, insane action movie we can. And yeah, you can laugh at it, but even the people who weren't seeing it as an ironic joke were also laughing at it because it's just a fun release. That's kind of a part of the reason for Hollywood and that's like why we go to the movies is because you had a wonderful time and you don't have to think about your stupid everyday problems and Furious 7 furiously does all those amazing things and still lives up to being your regular Fast and Furious film even though personally I don't think it's as good as 6 and 5 but it's still a worthy entry into the series and worthy way to just kick back and have a lot of fun while you laugh at cars coming out of planes and driving through a bunch of buildings and shit. So if you have seen Furious 7 and you would like to talk about it, then comment below in the comments and subscribe if you would like to. Check out my uh, Fast and Furious review playlist where I have all my previous Fast and Furious reviews and also I recently did a review for Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift which kind of comes into play in this film. And thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you next time. Thank you.